Let's take a peek at some horror films that many snub their noses at or overlook altogether. This is a little segment I like to call Low Budget Binge. Let's start binging. Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights. I'm M.L. Miller. Before we begin, please do me a favor and punch that like button down below. Share this video with all of your social media addicted pals. Click subscribe to this channel and ring that bell for notifications. Low Budget Binge is where we venture down the path less traveled and look at low budget, no budget, and sometimes international films that never get that top billing you see with the usual Hollywood fare. I'll indicate in the review down below where you can find these films along with their trailers. Here we go. Roadkill is in select theaters, on demand, and digital download from Uncorked Entertainment. It's directed and written by Warren Fast. As a gruesome killer makes his or her way through a long stretch of highway through a small town, a drifter, played by Ryan Knudsen, crosses paths with a young runaway with a fast car, played by Caitlin Carmichael. It's evident early on neither of these two are innocent, but which one is the predator and which is the prey? As the local sheriff, played by writer-director Warren Fast, searches for both of them, more bodies pile up across the long, dark road. Roadkill plays out like a low-budget version of Freeway, which starred a very young Reese Witherspoon and a very pervy Kiefer Sutherland. It's a farm with multiple twists and surly characters, and while the story is small-scale, I appreciate the film never really exceeding the limitations of its budget. This means that it delivers some lo-fi car chases, some okay choreographed fight scenes, and some limited but potent gore. I don't want to tout this one up too much, it's very derivative, but also has a grindhouse feel that made it utterly watchable. The dankness of all of the characters kept me interested, and while the story is predictable, it made for a fun time waster of a movie. Writer-director Warren Fast does a good job as the local sheriff, he's by far the best actor of the leads, the other two are capable, but while Caitlin Carmichael is very easy on the eyes, and Ryan Knudsen is doing his best John Wick impression, their thespian skills need a little work. Look for a brief cameo by Danielle Harris as a crossword-addicted waitress. Harris is always a highlight in any movie she's in. But don't expect big things. Roadkill is a low-scale grindhouser that works decently. Three Blind Mice is available on demand from Uncorked Entertainment. It's directed by Pierre B. A family decides to hold an intervention for young Abigail, played by Mae Kelly, who doesn't think her drug use is a problem. With a counselor in tow, the group decides to go to a secluded cabin in the woods, not knowing that nearby is a broken-down government experiment facility where three of its subjects roam freely among the ruins, hunting and killing anything they come in contact with. These subjects are human-rat hybrids who are also blind and cannibalistic, just like the nursery rhyme. Three Blind Mice. Though the plot takes the concept as literal as it comes, and it sets the victims up in the most cliched Cabin in the Woods location, Three Blind Mice takes these concepts and does a solid job squeezing every ounce of potential out of it. Many have made light of Blood and Honey, and the recent trend to adapt nursery rhymes with a horror slant, but honestly, I'll take this little lo-fi monster in the woods flick over a stale, insidious, or exorcist sequel any old day. The plot moves briskly, tossing the family into the path of the three monsters early on, so most of the rest of the film is a chase as the surviving family try to evade the three blind but still dangerous monsters in the woods. Director Pierre B. throws a lot of blood and gore as the rat people tear into their victims like they haven't eaten in weeks. The environment is taken advantage of pretty well, with many set pieces hinging around avoiding the rat monsters by keeping quiet a la A Quiet Place. The cast is solid as well and seemed to be sort of a troupe reused in numerous horror retellings of nursery rhymes from Dark Abyss Productions, which also produced Mary Had a Little Lamb and Last Year's Killing Tree. Mae Kelly is strong as the lead with her sexy raspy voice. She's not afraid to get down and dirty with these monsters. She plays a fallible hero who is easy to root for. The rest of the cast fall like bowling pins, but do their parts well. 
Three Blind Mice reminded me most of the Hills Have Eyes remake and its sequel as it plays heavily on government experimentation as the real bad guys here over the monsters who basically are just scrapping around to survive. Three Blind Mice is the opposite of elevated horror, which I guess can be called escalator horror, where you can just sit back and enjoy the ride and aren't really concerned about all of that thinking. There's room for both types in horror, and while it's nothing new, Three Blind Mice does a Monster in the Woods story really well. Mary Had a Little Lamb is available on demand from Uncorked Entertainment. It's directed by Jason Arbor and written by Harry Boxley. In a last-ditch effort to save her true crime podcast, Carla, played by Mae Kelly, and her daring group of online investigators try to be proactive and look into a series of disappearances in a wooded area outside of London. Turns out in the middle of this forest is a strange woman named Mary, played by Christine Ann Nyland, and her mute man mountain of a son named Lamb, played by Gaston Alexander. Once Carla and the crew find the house, Mary offers for them to stay the night, making them easy pickings for Lamb to axe them up into little pieces. Of the two nursery rhymes I've seen in the last few days, I preferred Three Blind Mice to the one-note Texas Chainsaw Massacre ripoff that is, Mary Had a Little Lamb. While much of the cast is the same, the story is extremely lacking. While the motivation had a more personal feel in Three Blind Mice, with the attention paid towards an intervention within a family, this one is simply about a headstrong investigator who doesn't care that she's diving headfirst into danger, no matter how many red flags are waving. Now, I don't mind a good Texas Chainsaw Massacre ripoff, as long as there's a skosh of originality and even a few decent moments of homage to the classic. And it's gotta be gory, of course. In Mary Had a Little Lamb, they don't even really try. For no reason at all, Lamb wears a lamb head mask and drools in the attic, waiting for his mother Mary to let him loose every night. Once unshackled, he simply picks up people and drags them around or whacks them with an axe. Not even the kills are original. I will say it was lovely to see Mae Kelly again, but she has less to work with here than she did with Three Blind Mice. I also think Christine Ann Nyland does a great job of playing the loony old Mary. The rest of Mary Had a Little Lamb is nothing you haven't seen before in Texas Chainsaw Massacre and all of its knockoffs. Lockdown Tower a.k.a. La Tour, is streaming on Shudder. It's directed and written by Guillaume Niclou. A French tenement building is covered in a thick, dark cloud blocking all contact with the outside world. With only what they have inside the tower, the residents of the building must do what they can to survive. But as time passes, and there is seemingly no end to this supernatural quarantine, floors of the tower become segregated by race, food becomes scarce, and humanity seeps from the tenants by the day. Lockdown Tower covers seven long years trapped inside this tower, taking the madness of a lockdown to horrifying and dreadful lengths. The premise is obviously a response to the recent lockdown we all experienced and does a great job of conveying the confusion, panic, and eventual acceptance of this new way of life we all went through just a few short years ago. Lockdown Tower is a rather joyless film, showing nothing but the hurt and heartache that comes when society falls. Even something as simple as a bedtime story rings with utter sadness and despair. So if you're looking for a cheery horror flick, this ain't it. Lockdown Tower goes to exhaustive lengths to show people at their worst. Racism, xenophobia, ageism, and even the right to have a child is changed due to the new situations. Food is so scarce that animals that were kept as pets are now bred as food. It gets so bad that children are even made so the adults can survive. It's pretty gruesome stuff, and while the film doesn't show every gory detail, the look of soullessness in the eyes of the survivors shows that they've witnessed some horrible things, and most likely did a lot of them too. The metaphor is thick in Lockdown Tower, ending with a bedtime story that is a little too opaque for me. I felt some kind of resolution to this predicament would have finished this story off more appropriately. Having the darkness pass and seeing how much society has devolved when they finally come out of their homes would have made the point Lockdown Tower is trying to make much more thunderous, in my opinion. Still, the quiet way this one fades out keeps in tone with the rest of this bleak film. There are quite a few lulls in Lockdown Tower, as director-writer Guillaume Niclou is much more interested in having the viewer wallow in the dread than give you a punchy story. 
most of the action, save for the initial panic, is cut away from, while the bulk of the time focuses on these poor souls simply trying to survive. Reminiscent of Xavier Jens's The Divide, from more than a decade ago, Lockdown Tower might be a bit too soon for some, but if you're looking for a survival film that is hopeless, bleak, and nihilistic, here you go. Finally, there's Ghosts of the Void, its new on-demand and digital download from Speakeasy Films. It's written and directed by Jason Miller. Jen, played by Tedra Milan, and her husband Tyler, played by Michael Regan, are a couple evicted from their home and forced to live in their car. Looking for a safe place to spend the night, they pull into a park in an affluent neighborhood only to be tormented by three masked strangers bearing weapons. Jen and Tyler attempt to survive the night while the film flashes back on how they arrived in this dire situation in the first place. Ghosts of the Void has a very familiar premise. For the most part, it's the strangers in a car, where a couple on their last leg find themselves tormented by masked creeps who appear and disappear in the darkness around them. Much of the same techniques used to make Brian Bertino's classic thriller work so well are utilized in Ghosts of the Void, such as long drawn out segments with masked marauders moving strategically in the background. While it might not have captured the atmosphere completely and immersed the viewer as much into the suspense as The Strangers did, writer-director Jason Miller does ape the style well, delivering quite a few sequences of sheer terror. One of the things that separates Ghosts of the Void from The Strangers is the reason this couple is in trouble in the first place. Given the current culture of this country, it's easy, believe me, too easy, to find oneself overwhelmed by bills, responsibilities, and other aspects of adulthood. Believe you me, I've paid my dues in situations like this, and while I've never lived out of my car, I've come damn near close a time or two in my long and storied life. What Ghosts of the Void does so well is illustrate how easy it is to take one or two wrong turns and how life's pressures can take their toll on a person's psyche as well as the bonds of a relationship. Tyler is a writer who is pursuing his dream to write his dream novel. Jen is supportive of Tyler's dreams, doing what she can to make a living. But as the bills pile up, filmmaker Miller, along with the deft performances of Milan and Regan, illustrate just how many problems can come from this type of situation. Add in the fact that Tyler is a drunk, and Jen is at her wit's end with panic attacks about bill collectors and evictions, and that's a whole lot of real-world drama going on. But Miller does a great job of making sure all of this melodrama doesn't overshadow the horrors that are lurking in the darkness just outside of the vehicle. All of the relational and adulting stuff only intensifies the situation all the more in this expertly paced white knuckler. While the idea of a strong female lead is not at all new to the horror genre, there has been a rise in stories featuring a woman who has become increasingly fed up and resentful of her ineffectual and entitled partner. I don't know if this is a sign of the times we live in, but seeing these themes show up in the recent Do Not Disturb, last year's Infinity Pool, and the excellent Danish thriller Speak No Evil, which is getting a big-budget American remake next year, and now here in Ghosts of the Void, it's hard not to see some kind of message about the male's role in a relationship and how modern culture may have caused that role to atrophy. It's a subject I want to explore maybe in a future essay now that I've noticed this trend, subversive and elevated horror. As is, Ghosts of the Void once again depicts the male lead as downright useless in day-to-day -day life, as well as during a time of great crisis. How those notions were implanted in the current cultural mindscape is debatable, but this trend is noticeably present in a lot of films these days and deserves some dissecting real soon. Though the vague title leaves a lot to be desired, is an impressive, small-scale horror revolving around both modern relationships as well as things that lurk in the dark. I definitely recommend this low-budget but high-impact little shocker. Stuck inside your reality You're doomed Oh, you're doomed You're Yeah.